Hey guys, John here with a silver update. I'm here with David Morgan from silver-investor.com, this time in person. David, nice to be with you. John, a pleasure, thank you. Well, last time we spoke it was via Skype and uh, silver was racing up to, I think at the time we were speaking, $22.50 and we were stunned and wondering why it was so high in price. And the, the uh, information uh, you spoke about in that interview was that uh, you know you thought we were entering a currency crisis and how is that playing out do you think and, and is continuing to play out? Well absolutely, all you have to do is look at the Euro and see that certainly the currency crisis, I mean Germany doesn't know what to do, there's talk about you know this QE2 or QE3 that may be upcoming, uh, central banks in Europe basically have done the same thing. They're trying to stimulate the economy, print their way out of it, make bigger loans, and increase the debt load. And all of that isn't working. Because if you go back to the Weimar Republic and look at what actually took place, the scream was there's not enough money all the way up. Which is ridiculous when you think about it because there was all kinds of money. Yeah. But it was what was the quality of the money mm -hmm. or what was the purchasing power. And that's the dilemma that we're in right now, and that is a currency crisis. Right. Well, that's right. And gold's racing off to, uh, I'm not sure what the latest price is, but last time it was about eighteen, nine hundred dollars $900. You know, for those who remember gold at $200, uh, they, they might be mistaken for thinking that now gold is in a bubble, but where are they wrong? Well, from my perspective, until you fundamentally fix the problem, you're going to see gold reflect the uncertainty market. So gold doesn't change as we both know. An ounce of gold has the same mass in the universe. So what changes? The uncertainty in the marketplace and the amount of dollars or euros or Australian dollars or candos or whatever printed against the amount of gold that's available, which is pretty fixed. It grows at maybe one percent a year. So gold is reflecting the uncertainty in the markets and it's been a touchstone for monetary history. In fact Jim Dines calls it the monetary hitching post of the universe. Mm -hmm. I don't think he's far off, at least from you know world history. Right. And silver then, conversely, at uh, forty dollars an ounce, uh, way above the cost of production. Really, when does silver become overvalued? Well, in terms of paper, that's a tough call. Again, I think I'd be looking for either in terms of the Dow, in terms of gold, which is you know the way I measure it the best which is I'm looking for to go back to a ratio around what I call the classical monetary ratio, mm -hmm. which is about 16 to 1. But as I wrote way, way back in the early 2000s, I wrote an article called Engineering the Price of Gold. Mm -hmm. And I know you went through this with Mike Maloney, but basically if you look at the amount of dollars printed versus the amount of gold that the Treasury purports the U.S. owns, mm -hmm. and you divide the two, what you come out is a theoretical price of gold. And I did that exercise, I think it was 2003, and it came out around $2,500 a ounce. Mm -hmm. But if you go back into history and you look at the exact same math formula, which is a simple division arithmetic problem, and you did it in 1980, you would have full gold coverage for M1 at $400 a ounce. Mm -hmm. Yet we all know, peak January 21st, 1980, at $850 on the spot market, about $875 in the futures exchange. So what that suggested to me, and I pointed out in this article, is that in times of very uncertain, uncertain conditions, or maybe the bubble, or whatever you want to refer to it as, it can overshoot sure. the theoretical or actual gold coverage. Mm -hmm. And that's what it did. Now, it didn't stay there very long, as we all know, but nonetheless, you could have had full coverage of M1 at 400, and yet it went to double that price. So if you take that same thinking into account, you go back to 2003, you say, well, 2,500 is full gold coverage of M1. That could suggest a doubling there would be 5,000 the ounce. So these people that state, you know, gold could go to 5,000 or 10,000, I don't think they're far off the mark. Again, it's not gold that changes. It's the perception of the purchasing power of what's going on in the global economy, the local economy, uh, or a nation state's economy. It's uncertainty. It's, it's fear, really. Uh, in a lot of ways, because people want certainty, and especially in a financial system, and when it's breaking down as it is now, they're going to seek something of value, something that they know is going to be you know, worth something. Sure. And this, as this uh, currency crisis plays out, no doubt what goes hand in hand with that is a, a crisis in the economy as well. You know, businesses suffer because of all sorts of reasons. How do you think if the economy does suffer to some great extent, silver will uh, perform to gold this time? 
I'll answer your question, but I want to digress a little bit. Yeah. And you've got, as you preluded to the question, a little bit about the uncertainty in the economy. Let's look at some of the corporate situations in the United States. You have some corporations that are very cash rich, and they just aren't doing anything. Why? Because of the uncertainty. In other words, in normal conditions, they would be looking to expand or grow their business or maybe uh, consolidate or merge or there's all type of things in a free market economy that without much capital you want to you know do something more do something better but that's not taking place why because there's too much uncertainty you don't know what the tax rates going to be next year you don't know what you know repercussions might be suffered going forward with the currency devaluing further and that type of thing so because of that there's a big stagnation in the economy but how do I think silver will play out going forward? I think it will do better than it did last time. Now, in 1980, silver actually had a huge run, as we know, mostly blamed on the Hunt brothers at the end. If the Hunt brothers actually did most of their buying well before silver peaked to $50 an ounce. The reason I think it will do even better this time is, one, there was about three times the amount of physical silver above ground available for investment in 1980 than there is today. Right. Secondly, it's a global market today, which it was not really. It was really a U.S. phenomenon back in 1980. Three, you've got the Internet. And I, can, I look at the Internet as being so substantial that it's equivalent to the Gutenberg printing press, mm -hmm. except it's global, and everybody that's really awake and aware is using it to get their information. So I think you've got less metal available you probably got 10 times the market size to purchase the metal, and it's better known amongst people uh, that speak in the Hispanic or Latin languages. The word silver and the word money are synonymous in 52 different places in the, in the world. Yeah. Yet all you hear about is gold is money, gold is money, is gold is money. Now, I'm not saying it's not. <laughs> what I am saying is if you go back to the Jewish religion, the word for money is this word for silver. It's not gold. Mm -hmm. So silver plays an important role as money throughout the world. It's only really in North America where you get this misperception mm -hmm. that silver isn't money. And you know, when this thing really takes off, you know, no one that's buying silver is going to worry about what David Morgan had to think about the silver market, mm -hmm. or Ted Butler, or anybody that's really involved in the silver market. They're going to buy it for one reason. They know it works. Yep. And speaking of those global markets, uh, the Pan Asia Gold market, Gold Exchange recently opened. What, what are your thoughts on that? Because a lot of people uh, thought this was going to be the saving grace that would end the manipulation. And uh, but, but from my perception, it's just really like another comex. Where do you sit on on that? Well, uh, similar to what I said about the advent of the SLB, the mm -hmm. uh, first uh, silver ex exchange trade. I said I'm neutral to slightly positive. Anything that brings more attention to be able to invest in silver, I'm, I'm for it. Sure. I'm positive toward it. What's going to happen is the physical market will trump the paper market at some point in time. And what happens if there'll be a price disparity or not, there probably will be, but I don't even want to project that. All I want to say is that at some point, the physical reality in either metal or both will supersede anything else. So if there's another exchange traded fund or another uh, entity that is set up like a COMEX anywhere in the world, does it help the market? Certainly it does. Yeah. Will it bring it to an end? The only thing that will bring it to an end is the day that there's a default mm -hmm. or there's a misdelivery or someone can't make good on a promise. And I think that day is approaching. Really? I do. Okay. And do you think it might be the COMEX first? Which, which uh, institution looks more vulnerable to you? Well, I don't know how it will unfold, so I'll be very honest about that. As far as the COMEX, if you read the rule book, there are so many ways for them to take care of the problem mm -hmm. and still be within the law mm -hmm. that, from my perspective, they will never default. Right. Uh, the reason being is they can make you sell for cash, yeah. or they can stop delivery, mm -hmm. or look at what happened in uh, the nickel market in uh, the LBMA. They actually made people that had physical lease back at not that great a rate yeah. to supply physical nickel into the market. I mean, there's things that go on in the financial realm that you would have to make up in a comic book, and yet <laughs> this is the stuff that actually takes place in today's world. So, you know, what will take place in my view is that somebody that is on the manufacturing side will probably need metal for you know, business, mm -hmm. and the normal, you know, two-week delivery time 
gets put out down. three weeks, four yeah. weeks, five weeks, that type of thing. And all of a sudden, we'll have to go to the spot market and buy it. And they, you know, call up the comments and say, well, we want uh, the limit. 1,500 contracts, we want 7.5 million ounces ASAP. And the company says, well, we can't do that. Yeah. So it's that type of thing. No one, no one is going to have the ability to say when and where. But why, I think it's obvious the demand will be for physical that cannot be met in a certain time frame. Another thing that's comical about the markets that I've noticed over the last few years is when gold rises, there's one person talking about it on, on whatever news site you're talking at. Um, but when gold falls, there's 10 or 20 people talking about it. Why do you think people love to talk about gold falling and not when it rises and rallies? Is that a perception you've noticed as well? Well, I mean, yeah. you, you know, I love to deal with fact, and it is a fact. You yeah. get a lot more cheerleading on gold in the mainstream media yeah. when it falls or when it rises. And there's a bias there. Of course, I'm biased the other way. Sure. I'm for a sound, a sound financial system. Yeah. But what you have is uh, a, a, a the idea that gold is this barbarous relic, it doesn't pay dividends, it really doesn't do much for capital formation, and it doesn't. It does a lot for capital preservation, not capital formation. Mm -hmm. Nonetheless, it's the only place I think you can be uh, in these uncertain times, as I've said many times during this interview. So it's a idea that I think they want to get across to the general public. You know, most of these people that are in the mainstream are pro-stocks mm -hmm. and pro-business, and I am pro-business, I am pro-companies, I am pro-capitalism. Mm -hmm. Nonetheless, again, as we said earlier, look, if, you, if you're a really going concern in a corporate state, in a, in a corporation, where do you go if you don't know what things are going to cost you the day after tomorrow, if you don't know what the tax rate will be, if you don't know if there's going to be some environmental impact that's going to take down your business two years out. These are things that really worry businessmen, businesswomen, because they don't know the future. There's too many unknowns right now. What yeah. we need is stability, and we are getting anything but stability. That's What's right. stable is an ounce of gold, an ounce of silver. That's stable. That's always the same. Yeah, that's right. And one, one final question. What, do, what does the top of these markets look like to you? What do you think the top of these markets, uh, the gold and silver markets, will look like? How will it play out? What will be the world we live in at that time? Well, first of all, I think it's going to go down to the financial record books. I think you're going to see the biggest feeding frenzy into the metals you've ever seen in world history. I think it's going to be, obviously, a global market, and you're going to see you know, paper prices that will astound everyone. As far as what will the world look like, I think it depends where you are. I think it will be different places. It will look differently. I mean, no one's going to stop trading. Uh, there will be instances where a lot of businesses at the margin will go under. There'll be a lot of unemployment. There'll be a lot of businesses that have failed. There'll be a lot of reorganizations of corporate structure. And I think, generally speaking, what you'll see is you'll see a return to smaller uh, self-organizing collectives. In other words, you'll see smaller businesses and more tightly knit around small communities. So you see a huge downsizing across the globe. Let's just take the transportation problem for an example. I mean, I'm able to buy grapes any time of the year. I love grapes, okay? okay? But yet, if you factor in the transportation costs on those, as this unwinds further, it's going to be ridiculously expensive to get these uh, fruits that we take, you know, for granted that don't grow locally here. So you're going to see a lot more local. Uh, Washington's famous for apples. I'll probably have all kinds of choices for apples, <laughs> but I not, might not get the amount of citrus available at the time. So I think that's what you'll see. I think you're going to see a, an unwinding, but it's certainly not the end of the world. It's not that we won't trade. And I think what we really need is some strong leadership. We need people to stand up and explain what's really going on. And we have to get rid of the toxic assets that exist in the financial system and be able to get rid of those and start with pretty much a clean slate. And there are ways to do that. Well, David, we look forward to hearing um, how to do that from you from silver-investor.com. Thanks very much for your time. Pleasure to meet you, and we'll talk soon. Thank you, John. My pleasure.